it's time for another top five, which we hope will appeal to all you mountain bikers out there. It's so easy to get dragged into the upgrade arms race, dropping hundreds or even thousands of your hard earned cash on trying to improve your bike to the nth degree. And while there's nothing wrong with upgrades, and fair play if you do, we reckon there are plenty of expensive ones you may not need to buy. Remember, don't get angry with us if we've just mentioned the entirety of your credit card bill. Bikes are meant to be fun, and so is upgrading them. Before we delve too deep, don't forget to like, subscribe, and click that little bell icon so that every time we upload a new video, you get a notification. Component manufacturers love big numbers. They imply strength, stiffness, and muscularity, which must mean they're better, right? Back in the day, handlebar clamp diameters were set at 25.4 millimeters. Then, the oversized standard of 31.8 millimeters arrived, and for a long time, it was the standard, and we think that was a good thing. In modern, wider widths, skinnier bars were either flexy or heavy. Neither good things. However, this oversized standard seemed to give the right balance of weight and stiffness, whether in carbon or alloy. Then, fast forward to just a few years ago, and yet another standard arrived in the shape of 35mm bars. While they're claimed to be stiffer for a given weight, we found, in many cases, 35mm bars are simply too stiff. This can make them feel a little harsh, negating the promised advantages. So, we don't think we would be spending three-figure sums to upgrade our bar and stem for the sake of 3.2mm. There's no doubt, carbon is cool, with its sleek lines, futuristic weaves, and super lightweight, bomb-proof performance. However, ask any Bike Radar mountain bike staffer, and you'll find few who spend their own cash on plastic parts. Why are we here, you ask? Well, Alloy components are so good that any supposed performance gains from carbon can often be marginal, especially given their higher prices. Sometimes we've even found expensive wheels, bars or cranks can detract from the bike's feel. If the stiffness and lightness aspect is overdone, you can end up with a light but harsh feeling ride. We're not saying every carbon component is bad, but sometimes it may be better to save the cash and give our bikes a full metal makeover. Every few years, Shimano and SRAM come out with their latest and greatest new group set, with more cogs, bigger range, and even wireless shifting. They're beautiful feats of engineering and work incredibly well, but that doesn't mean we'd always recommend you go out and buy them. Why? Because second and third tier group sets come with nearly all the whistles and bangs, but at a much more affordable price. So what would we do ourselves? We'd go 12 speed for sure. However, We'd aim for those mid-level components, avoiding the weighty base-level cassettes and mixing and matching between tiers in certain areas. With Shimano, we'd go for SLX-level kits, but would splash out on an XT shifter, as it gets the dual release lever, which in our experience feels very crisp. When it comes to SRAM, GX Eagle works well, though we may be tempted by an X01 Drailer if budgets can stretch. Almost as controversial as e-bikes and the never-ending wheel size debate is electronic components on mountain bikes. Now, we've no philosophical aversion to them. If they work great, then great. If they don't, not so great. But you won't find many of us hanging them off our own bikes, yet. Why? It's down to their cost being so high compared to their mechanical counterparts, meaning those cost-benefit lines never quite cross. That's not to say they aren't without their merits. Clean, crisp, consistent performance, and no annoying cables to worry about. But the cost of replacing a damaged electronic rear mech or shifter? Boy, it is expensive. Cable parts have worked well for years, and will continue to do so at a much more affordable price than electronics. So fingers crossed, one day we'll have fancy electronic exotica, which is available to the masses. But until then, is it an upgrade you really need? Although there is perhaps one exception, the RockShox Reverb Axis. In use, the dropper is as good, if not better than the competition, while its wireless setup makes fitting so very, very simple. In fact, if you had two bikes that both needed a new dropper, buying one Reverb AXS almost makes financial sense. Almost. Upgrading forks is a fairly common thing to do on a bike, but shocks tend to get left behind and perhaps that's no bad thing. Shocks are often tuned specifically to the frame they're bolted to, so upgrading to something new isn't always as simple as buying the latest and greatest shock. 
There are also a multitude of fittings, lengths and measurements which need to be right. You may also be drawn in by the latest generation, which seem to allow adjustments to almost everything. However, with so many adjustments available, it can be really easy to get the setup wrong, whereas a simple shock, fitted from stock, should be pretty spot on. If you're not happy with the feel of your shock, consider getting it tuned by a pro, rather than spending hundreds on one that may, or may not, actually improve things. So what do you think to our list? Did we get it right, or should we have picked something else? As always, let us know in the comments, don't forget to like and subscribe, and click that little bell icon, so that every time we upload a video, you get a notification. Goodbye!